Okay. I got this is a little, a little session on the scope. Now, you guys that are in engine performance, and I think the ones that are in uh, fundamental, they've all, I've got some oscilloscope training. And so don't try to dodge that or bypass it because it's pretty important that you understand what we got going on here. <clears throat> and this one here is a, is a really interesting little deal. Uh, and I'm going to give there several little interesting things about this. But I drew a job once on a 1990 Eagle Talon with a brand new car had never been sold. And I usually do this, tell this story with drawing on the board, but I'm going to do it this way this time. And every few hours, the anti-theft would activate. This is a brand new car. It's still on the lot, Brandon. They couldn't sell it like that. But then sit there for a while and all of a sudden, honk, 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 and flash the lights and blowing horn for three minutes. Nobody's anywhere around it. It's just going wacky with the thing. So they said, well, we can't sell it. So what are we going to do about this? And give it to him. So he gives it to me. You know, I'm always one that winds up with these. So and I would look at this thing and I said, look, the only thing that could make this happen is if you had interference on from one of these four switches. You got door, door, hood, hatch. Okay. Now, and whenever this thing detects that one of those panels has been open, whenever the it's armed, then you're going to have issues. Now it waits a little bit to arm itself. After you arm it, I think it's 40, 30 seconds or something. If I remember that. This was a long time ago. Because think about it. This was a brand spanking new car in the '90 model. That's how long ago this was. Okay. All right. We focused on these four wires. Now the one peculiarity. And I noticed as I was researching this today, I mean last night, was the uh, this switch right here is normally closed, which is a sort of an oddity because all the rest of them are normally open. Right? That switch right there is a switch that doesn't do anything. This one's the only one that is using on that. But anyway, whatever happened, I just had to do that. I built me a little box. I went down to Radio Shack and I got some money out of my pocket and I built me a little box. I put these little, the battery, now this is going to be hooked up to the battery on the car. I actually just put the battery in the box because it was easier to draw it that way. And I got these little teeny tiny fuses that were like a quarter of an amp, so the least little thing could pop that fuse. I mean, it had no uh, resistance much whatsoever. And I had those fuses burning LEDs. Now, I also had, I didn't put that in this thing, but I had resistors. I had a resistor in line with each LED so that it wouldn't burn out. If you just plug an LED directly to power, it's going to cook it. So you got to put a resistor in series in LED. I didn't put that in the schematic because I don't want to, you know. And these are indicator lights that I put on here. And I wired them up to each one of these. That one to that one. This one hooked into the wire. Back probe the little wires at the module, which was down by your passenger's right foot. And then I hooked these things up. All right. And then I told some guys that were working late that night, I said, don't touch this car if the alarm goes off, just leave it alone. So I had a box laying there, four little lights burning on it. And if anything happened that night, the light that turned off was going to tell me where the problem was. Okay, so when I came in, I went to punch in next morning, one of them that got there earlier than I did that morning said, uh, I don't even remember why those guys that were working so late at night, let's say they were pre-delivering a bunch of cars or something. But anyway, they said, uh, that thing lit off last night about 7 o'clock, honk, 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 for about three minutes. I said, well, that's good. That's what I wanted it to do. I had it sitting in my service bay. And I went over and I looked in there, and one of these lights was out. And what it had done is it had blown that fuse, and what that did is it pointed me at this switch right here. Now, once again, that's a normally closed switch. I'm not sure why it's drawn that way, but I do know that that pointed that. And when I run a uh, replacement wire from here to here, Cut that out, ran a replacement wire from that switch to that controller, that problem never happened again. Now it was a little tricky running the wire because the wire, the switch switch was on the right front fender and the wire harness had traveled across the radiator support, back into the driver's side, across under the dash and down to the module. That wire went a long way. And I managed to put it in a harness and feed it through, straight through to the module which cut a lot of links out too, but I had it done in such a way where you couldn't tell it never worked on it. And that's the way you're supposed to do factory or got repaired. But this was designed to take an intermittent fault and store the event. This thing didn't have scan tool capability, especially not on the anti-theft system. Nowadays they do, on a Jeep or something like that. If it's whatever, the, whatever lit the anti-theft off last time, it'll tell you it was the tailgate, it'll tell you it was the door, it'll tell you it was the hood. Whatever lit it off, it'll tell you on the scan tool screen usually. All right, now I could have done the same job with a digital storage oscilloscope. Got it set up. That's my little box. I had actually drawn a picture of that so you'd see it. I always build a lot of little things. But anyway, 
if I'd connected a four tray scope to those wires instead of triggering a catch or glitch, I could have accomplished the same purpose. All right. So, what can a scope check? A lot more than most of us think. We used to use scopes for ignition patterns back in the day. You know, whenever we'd have a pattern like that, we got one, these are spark plug, you know, we got one, four, two, five, three, six, and we go to number four, we're going to find out we got really high resistance in that secondary. Now, the secondary and the primary, the primary is the trigger that fires the coil, the secondary is where the work's being done. That's the way it is on a relay or on a ignition coil. So whatever's triggering is your primary, wherever the work's being done is secondary. All right, so this is your little pattern here. I'm going to go into that right now. But I had a, a, at the Volkswagen place when I first started using a scope, and this was in the early 80s, I rolled a, uh, we had a scope that actually was suspended from the ceiling. And you could move it around to most every service bay in that one area over there. And it was a sun scope, and you could hook it up to the ignition system. And I figured it out pretty quick how that thing worked, but I had one where all of this, uh, the little, this little part of the pattern right here, was really crazy and going really high when I would give it gas and it was just, you know, sputtering and popping and cutting up. And it turned out that that one other did not have an ignition problem. It had a fuel problem, but the ignition uh, scope showed me where it was. The fuel filter was stopped up on it. And it turned out that it was causing the fire in land, which is supposed to be a nice steady burn, to be wild and crazy and, you know, going way up here because it was running really, really mean. That one every cylinder. Now here are the TP sensor trays. Some sensor failures are going to set a code and some won't. Scope can draw a picture. This was a Toyota Tacoma that we had in here, and they got normal voltage at idle. We popped the throttle, let off, and then it went kind of wacky. Down here and back up here like this, and that's making it do things that it's not supposed to at idle and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that was a fairly simple fix. We didn't have any wiring issues. We just put a throttle position sensor on it, and we were good to go. All right, watch the video if it'll play. This is quick. This is one I did here. I hadn't been here probably three months when I made this video. Now this is when you rip it up, he goes boom, boom. See that? Right, see what the scope's doing? As soon as you crank the throttle, the scope's hit the top. That confuses the engine control. It's a 90 model Nissan, okay? The throttle body is good. All right, now watch what happens as we bring the TP sensor on it. See, we're revving it up exactly the same way. It's accelerating well, and your TP sensor is not doing any of that hard wash. You got it? That was a different scope that I don't have anymore for you guys. Now then, let me back up. I think I went too far. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Here's your chem crank wave formula 543 valve that we had in here. Uh, now, you need a good pattern for comparison purposes. This one came from my ATN. All right, so here we've got, see these cam sensors? See how they're perfectly lined up with one another? And they're lined up with that particular spike on that. That's 14 of those over there, if you count them. All right, this one here is a pattern we pulled out here with our pikoscope. And you see how this one here is lined up where it's supposed to be. This one's over to the left. So that one's out of line with that one. It's supposed to be right line straight up. That one right there, those sliders on the timing chains, had broke. And the timing chains were was running slack. And it was causing it to be out of line. Green traces, right, blue is out of line. That one is out of time on the right thing. Now this one right here was one that smacked us around for a while. And the crazy thing about these Jeeps is they will give you primary coil misfire codes and have something totally unrelated to that being wrong with them. In other words, call primary codes. This one here was, whenever you drove this one a ways, it would start dropping companion cylinders. And it wasn't always the same two. It would be one and six, two and four, you know, three and four, you know, let's say two and five or three and four. All right. And so what was wrong with this one? There's a, you can actually, Adjust your cam sensor. This is a crank sensor. Cam sensor, you're supposed to set it so that this is halfway between those two. That's a good idea to have you have yourself, a, if you get yourself a scope, build yourself a waveform library of good vehicles, and that way you won't be, of course, you won't always, you'll have to get one occasionally from, you know, sources like ATN. On this one, you line it up on zero, crank, 
top dead center compression, line the cam, this would be like where your distributor would be on an engine with a distributor, when you line it up so that hole's lined up, the, the hole in the outside is lined up with the hole in that main, when you adjust it so that's right and you lock it down, it'll be like this. But because this thing was dropping companion cylinders, throwing us all these oddball codes, we worked on it for about a week until, you know, I managed to, you know, squeeze out what was going on. I found out I could have fixed it with a toothpick. And I wrote that, that article, Scan Tools, Those Scopes, and Toothpicks, and uh, Mac Vandenbrink sent me a copy of one of his uh, scope things, and also he sent me a toothpick. Well, that's pretty good. All right, so the 85 volts cutlass OBD1 waste spark system. This is an old car. Uh, but it had, it was the first year that they put waste spark coil packs on it. Alright, it ran really bad with a rough idle and misfires on the road. It acted like EGR was flowing. I mean, I thought EGR was flowing, but I found out it wasn't. Even the manifold was feeling hotter than it should. But it turned out, it had no chem signal, and they shop in another town to replace a fuel filter. This was a prime. There's a little old lady, a little white-haired lady on this car. She's already passed away now. But what happened was, they put a fuel filter on it, she drove it across town, it wasn't running any better, it developed a big fuel leak from where they put the fuel filter on it. They sent a wrecker after it, they charged her to haul it back over there, and then charged her to refix the leak that they made, and the car still ran just as bad. <laughs> I don't get this, you know. But, uh, anyway, the, this guy that, I, that I've known for years that also knew her brought the car over here and he qualified it for work. But anyway, the point is, cam signal looks like that right there. See that? Had a bad cam signal, no cam signal rather, and then this one here had a good cam, and it ran so much better. But this one also wound up having a bad ignition module, and the way we got that was, uh, you know, we could have scoped that, but we got a timing light with a long lead on it, put it in the floorboard, shined it in on the carpet when we were driving along, when it would cut up and, you know, driving down the road under a load, and it would actually, the timing light would flash, stranger, and so we put an ignition module on it and finished fixing the rest of it. The alternator stator test, all you got to do is really easy hookup on that on your scope. This one right here was a car that I had, and the alternator was faulty on it. It was still putting out for the mark. Most part, just wasn't quite putting out right. It was making noise. You hear an alternator sound like a ceiling fan, you know, you got issues with that. And a good, this is a lot of a funky, bumpy looking thing. It's a noisy pattern, but that's the same car with a replacement alternator. Well, you see this big, tall, ugly thing that fills up the whole deal? You'll see textbook pictures of alternator patterns that are that look different from this. But I've, every time I've ever seen it, it'll be really tall and ugly up there. And that charging system tester's got a stator check on it, but I don't really trust it quite as well as do a scope. Now, this is what we were doing out there a while ago. All right, yellow is first look on uh, fuel regulator, blue is silver, one injector voltage. See that right there? All right, and so. First look sensor. And this one here, 142536. Uh, 142536. All right. Now, that's your first the first look sensor. That's that thing we got out there. You saw it. You remember? All right. The first look sensor trace removes any doubt. The injectors aren't fired. Or fire, it shows a weak fuel pressure pulse on four with no pulse at all on cylinder five and six. All right. You see the the pulse, 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 absence of a pulse, pulse, absence of a pulse, and pulse. So these right here were the ones that were firing over there. What in the world was that? Probe, back probe needle, the probes. A lot of people do that. And you, you also, uh, uh, I know uh, this one guy that was an instructor at that last uh, Casey Vision I went to, uh, he uses little pick probes like we use sometimes. But he put he covers up the little place where he pricked the wire with some clear stuff to do that. Little old Jonathan kind of goes off here. Uh, really here's, a, here's a good case study on a VW Polo from Master Mechanic Tari Raymond Sawira. I probably butchered that name. Uh, he lives in Zimbabwe. And he says the vehicle just died only while it was idling in the parking uh, lot. The customer was concerned to crank no start. And his first step in working on it was to check wiring and connections. And Zimbabwe is right here, by the way. This is where this guy lives in Zimbabwe. All right. So the next thing, he did a scan. Didn't help a lot. Got 28 codes off of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was basically saying that uh, these and the other diagnostic control codes were probably due to a discharged battery. And the way that he put it was the battery was flat. That's how that's the words he used, which is a different way of saying the same thing, battery dead. He talked to these and the other, probably due to this battery in his first. He's going to do a relative cranking current test to check for cylinder contribution to see if, you know, if any of them was. But look at this. 
he actually was measuring it from peak to peak 138 amps. Right? That's the first indication of a problem. Too much peak to peak amperage and it was across the board. See? So basically you got an issue with that relative cranking current using a high amp clamp and you hook that thing up and you what you want to do is you want a marker where you'll know where the cylinders are and you go whoa, 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 whoa. And it's a four cylinder, right? So that one right there, see this is repeating. But you see that? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's it spinning over. This is what it should look like. 77 amps from peak to peak. It's what it, that's, the, that's what it should look like on the same car, but it's been like it's supposed to. All right, what do you think is wrong now so far? Think about it. Anybody got anything to offer on that? That resistor. Hmm? That resistor? No resistors. So less than the amount of charge that's going in to start the start. No, it's, it's actually, much. it's harder to turn the engine than it should be, what? It's too much resistance. Too much resistance, is that what you were, yeah. Well, we'll see. Uh, you, you got a, that's sort of right, but we want to know what the reason for it is. We want to verify if the cylinders are getting sparked. So we back drove the four-wire top pole in the ignition pole and trigger a current waveform. We have the ECM command as well as the primary coil saturation. This right here is current, current ramping. And this right here is voltage. So whenever it turns on the coil, it starts to saturate. Then when it turns off the coil, that's when the spark happens. You see it falls off suddenly. This is nice and healthy. Good current ramp showing from good primary ramp. Turn on oscillations. Secondary wind integrity is good. Ignition coil current. You got to look at this a lot of these before you get to where you can, and understand what you're looking at. So you'll know. Ignition coil firing trigger from ECM. All right. So. All right, now this is the injector normal pattern. Who, who has seen this already this week? You guys seen an injector pattern? Yesterday, remember that? That's what this looks like. This is normal voltage. You're getting on the side that fires the injector. This is normal voltage. This is when it turns on the injector. That's how long it stays on the current wrap in the injector, too. You want to see how that looks. There's a panel bump showing whenever the injector panel pops open. And then there's your panel closing. You can see that right there which is pretty cool. And there's your injector current limit is right there and then, you, and then your current over there. Anyway, now we're going to take a fuel pressure check here, which is what we were kind of doing here, except we were, he was checking fuel pressure. All right, we use that little transistor there on this one. And so the fuel pump running at rail pressure was 44. Pump turns off, it stays at 40. All right, so it doesn't leak down. That's the point. Remember, you were talking. You were, we were talking about it not leaking down. We don't want it to leak down because it'll make it start hard. All right. Next, so we want to make sure there's volume and no restriction. We're going to do the dynamic testing using a low amp clamp on the fuel pump. How many of you have done this? Remember when we were checking a fuel pump for waveform? You can find the integrity of it. All right. Vertical straight up. Whenever it first starts turning, it pulls more current. And you expect that. It's going to go up to like 19 amps and then it drops back down. You know, and then you see these little commutator segments. All right, so the time between the rulers here is 15.7 seconds. Pump speed 39.82, eight commutator segments, stabilized currents 5.2 amps. That's about what we've been measuring, isn't it? When we measure one that's pumping fuel. You know, when you're measuring the amps and it's not pumping fuel, you got like one and a half amps. Okay. This one here is pumping fuel. All right, now this right here is an in cylinder compression pin. This is really important. This is not the last time you'll see this if you're serious about this and you keep working on the car. This one right here does not look normal. Uh, what you basically got is you got your, this is the pressure spike whenever you're at top dead center compression. And you got your expansion stroke. And the pressure drops as the piston is driven down. All right, now right here, as the piston starts coming back up, we should see the pressure rise a little bit. But when the exhaust valve opens, you should see the, I mean, the exhaust should be going out, but it's going out under pressure, so you're going to see more pressure in there. This one here is just all messed up. This doesn't look anything like it's supposed to look. It's got this hump here that doesn't even belong there. All right, think about it. What do we got? What you thinking? Valves in the exhaust valve. Listen to that. What do you suppose could cause valve issues like that? Uh, and shaft breaks, or is rounded off. Yeah, it's doing it across the board. All the, the whole engine's doing this. The catalytic converter as well. No, you said the exhaust valves. 
Yeah, we're getting there. We're, we got valve issues. All right. Now this is kind of what it's supposed to look like. And I'm going to give you a sharper depth, part for more defense. You see, here's your pressure. This is how you're going to determine, you know, it's your marker. All right, so this is going to, see how it, the piston starts up? You're going to have this little wavy where it goes up, and then if the, basically the exhaust valve close, and this is your intake stroke. And then there's your compression stroke, and it starts all over again. This is going to define it a little better for you. See that exhaust? Well, the exhaust valve open. So you got to remember, you're way down here, this is at the end of your intake stroke. You got a compression stroke here where the pressure goes really high. And then as the piston's driven back down, the pressure drops way down in here. And then your exhaust valve opens and the pressure jumps up as the piston's going back up. But it doesn't go up very much because the exhaust valve is open as then that pressure out. Then the exhaust valve closes and now you've got low pressure as the air is coming back in before you start your next stroke. Everybody getting that? Everybody paying attention? Somebody just wanted to be sitting here hoping this will be over with so we can go have our burger and not even think about this anymore, right? All right. So, can't get to the valves without pulling all of this stuff off. You know, so unfortunately on that engine, you got to remove intake, exhaust kilns, access the valves. So you had all the reasons to suspect the timing belt. Timing belt. Okay, out of time. Opened up the cam timing cover and there was a problem. Broken intake and exhaust coupling toothed belt. That's what he called it, timing belt. So this one's got a... A valve, I mean a belt here, a little short belt, and it's got a long belt. Got two belts, two different lengths on that. Um, uh, replace the both timing belts, both tensioners and idle points. We put all that in there and took care of it. So you got that, that one there and that one there. And you get a kit from that little short belt and top and all that. That should have been really good instruction. And it may have been a little deep for some of y'all, but if you're exposed to it, you're going to know as soon as you see this pattern, some of these patterns, you know, with the cylinders, you're going to know what you're looking at now. Now, would you like for me to put this on your test? Could you remember it? You don't know? Does that need to, be, that need to put a pattern like that on your engine performance test and let you identify the different parts of the, of the pattern? Got a, got a, got a, got a head nod right there. We need, yeah. we need a little bit more practice. A little more practice? Yeah. You're going to stay awake next time? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. All right. So, did you get some benefit out of this? That's what I'm asking about. This is the kind of stuff that whenever I go to those schools up there, we go through this kind of thing. Now, this guy right here that, that captured these videos did some of the best screen prints I've ever seen out of a regular shop. And he was very methodical. You notice that he checked this. And it took him... Uh, he said about 35, maybe 40 minutes to gather all this information and sort it out in his mind before he actually went in there and started doing other things. Now, let me ask you this. You're going to check, if you're going to check, and some of you guys have already heard me say this before, what, how am I going to do, like if I'm going to a four-cylinder engine, let's say I can get to the timing belt really easy, how am I going to determine if it's in time? Let's say it's a timing belt equipped four-cylinder. What do you do? Okay. You can um, check the top line. dead, yeah, QC and then CFP. Normally it's like a little half front or a little you triangle. the cams are pointing out. Mm -hmm. All you right, yep. that's here's that's what I'm going to do. And everybody remember this. Oh. Don't forget it. Line up your cam mark first. Forget about your crank. Line up your cam shaft, right? Yeah. Now this is on a free spinning engine. You know, if it's not a free spinning engine, you're probably going to have, you know, valves touching pistons and all kinds of bad stuff anyway. But line up the mark on your cam first. Now, if you pull the, cover, the valve cover off on like one of these little 2.2 liter engines and the timing chain flopping around all down there, you need to do all that. Just, you see that, that's all you need to see. But I mean, if you're, let's say a lot of times you'll have a timing belt that will just jump a couple of teeth. And it, it'll still be running. It just won't be running right. It'll be surging or cutting up or won't have enough power. Late valve timing does what? Low engine vacuum, low power. Yeah. Got it. Screws the fuel trims up. Um, this one guy put a Mustang back together one time and he had one of the teeth, a, a tooth off on, on the, one of the camshafts. And the, uh, the right bank was running it. Uh, fuel trims of 10 plus, the left bank was running it 10 minus. <laughs> you know, which was weird. But it ran really good. It, ran, it was a strong running thing. And he basically had degreed the camshaft accidentally. Anyway, the point is, uh, if you line that cam up, Every time you line that cam up, that crank ought to be lined up. 
but when you, you may line up the crank on TDC, but the cam can be somewhere else. So I always line up the camshaft and then look at the crank. That way I'm only doing one step. Got it? So when I line that up, number one's on top dead center if it's a four, or any of them really. But if you've got time and belt issues, that's the quickest way to find that. And always try to figure out, if you can, by looking at your procedures and all, if this is a free spinning engine or not. Because if it came in just needing a time and belt and hadn't jumped, and you fumble around and bend the valves, it's on you. So don't go there. Make sure you know. Mitsubishi's, even though they got time and belts, maybe not be a free spinner. Usually they aren't. Uh, Kia's, if a Kia jumps time, it breaks the heads off the valves and beats the crap out of the piston head, destroys the cylinder head, just it's, it's engine time. If it's a Kia, and if it's if you're looking at somebody's car and you can tell it hadn't had a timing belt put on, or they know it hadn't had one put on, and it's going past that 60 or 80 or 100 thousand mile interval, you better say, look, you better put a timing belt on this. Thing. I'm talking about as soon as you can. It's best to, for you to be the one to pick the time than it is for the car to pick it, because it's going to pick the wrong time. It's going to pick when you're halfway to Key West or whenever you're going somewhere else or when you're out on a date or something like that. And the long and the short of it is you don't want this thing breaking whenever it decides to break. You want to say, I'm the one that's going to decide when my time and belt gets replaced. I'm not going to let the car decide. <laughs> and I had that one girl that came in here and she said, I said, we hear your time and belt slapping the cover on this little four-cylinder Isuzu, I don't remember what it was, old uh, SUV. And she goes, okay. And so I got the time and belt. She was supposed to bring it back the next day. She didn't show. And about three months later, she came and says, she said, I should have come back the next day and got my timing belt put on. My timing belt broke when I was up there by Walmart and it cost $1,500 to fix it. But see, it would have been 40 something bucks if she had let us put the timing belt on. It would have been hard to do. And when that thing jumped, it was bam, bam, bam. You know, all kind of interference going on in there. Not all of them are like that. A little Toyota engine like that. Ford Escarts aren't like that unless they got a 1.8 in it. So you got a lot of vehicles that are interference. If it's got a timing chain on it, they're going to be interference engines. Some timing belts are, some aren't. Find out what it is before you start working on it. Line the timing marks up before you pull the belt off. Got it? Okay. That's about it.